Well, welcome once again. Good to see you guys there online. Well, I can't see you, but I'm sure you're there. Lord bless you. We're going to continue to move on here through the book of of John, through the gospel of John. And yeah, just thanks, uh, Trev, you already announced it, but thank you everybody that came and gave us an opportunity to uh, have service here. Um, I'm bringing out my trusty devotional. I'd like to read something to you. Apparently, I heard that it's Valentine's Day. Happy Valentine's to all of you. It's called Strong Heart. His mother gave him a Latin name that means strong heart. She knew that her son needed to be strong in the world that was falling apart, kind of like today. Rome was in its death throes, and barbarian Goths were moving south to feed like vultures on its carcass. But Strongheart grew up to justify the name his mother gave him. As a courageous pastor, this son of wealth brought hope to a terrified Rome. Christians and pagans alike celebrated his outrageous acts of charity. His joy was so contagious that even Rome's rulers turned a blind eye to his preaching. Then a new emperor rose up to save Rome. Marcus Aurelius Claudius was determined to put an end to the Gothic menace. Every Italian man was conscripted into military service and single men were forbidden to marry. And married men were prohibited from sleeping with their wives. Claudius wanted every ounce of energy focused on defeating the Goths. But there were, there were young lovers in Italy. When no one else dared to perform a wedding, lovesick couples found their way to the pastor who was famous for his compassion. Strongheart defied an emperor and performed hundreds of illegal weddings. Almost all of those nuptials ended with new believers being baptized. When word of the clandestine ceremonies reached the palace, Strongheart was dragged before an irate emperor. But his contagious joy softened Claudius's hard heart. Palace observers wrote that the pastor could have walked away a free man had he not pressed Claudius to come to Jesus. Instead, the emperor angrily sentenced him to die. Death Row did nothing to blunt Strongheart's joy. His jailer was so impressed that he brought his blind daughter to visit the prisoner, hoping that the man's exuberance would pull her out of a lifetime of self-pity. Soon both were laughing, and within days they were in love, and on the eve of his execution, the pastor wrote a final love letter to his sweetheart, signing it in a way that is still celebrated today. At dawn, Strongheart forgave each of his executioners and implored them to receive Christ as their Savior. They repaid his lavish love by beating him so brutally that his great heart exploded. Hang in here. Perhaps that's why a blood-red heart still symbolizes his life. Scholars long speculated that Strongheart's story was just another medieval myth. But archaeologists recently uncovered the remains of an ancient church in Rome. Chiseled in its doorway arch are the words of Pope Julius I honoring a man named Strongheart who died on February 14th. You may never have heard of Emperor Claudius who died of disease around the same time, but today you remember Strongheart whose Latin name was Valentinius. And the way he ended that final letter to his sweetheart, your Valentine. Giving your heart away is risky. Too many folks try to protect their heart from hurt. If you're tempted to play it safe with love, remember St. Valentine's story in light of something Mother Teresa once said. If you give until it hurts, there is no more hurt, only love. So a new commandment taken from the passages that we're looking at here in John 13 through 17, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another by, all, by this all people will know that you are my disciples by your love for one another. We're continuing on in this series from the Gospel of John. This fifth week, it's the fifth week, our text for today will be from John chapter 15, verses 1 through 11. So if you have a Bible, make sure you grab it. Last week we looked at John 14 and saw it was, and really this whole passage here, this whole section of Scripture is the Lord's last will and testament. 
We looked last week in John 14, and the Lord left us with a gift, and the gift was the Holy Spirit. And he left us with a command. The command was, if you love me, you're going to obey me. The theme of today's teaching will be this word, and the word is remain. And as I looked up that word, it means this, to be part, not destroyed, taken, or used up. The Lord will use this word many times in this passage, to remain. Other translations use the word abide. Here the word remain is the key to understanding a growing disciple who must continually, 24-7, be connected to Christ. This is what it means to remain. You're in such an integral relationship with Christ that you can never walk away. And that's what the Lord was really trying to impart to his, to his hearers and to us thousands of years later. Remain. Remain in me. And I'd like to look at three topics in regards to remain from those 11 verses that we'll look at today. So with that, if you'd bow your head, we'll pray. Yeah, Lord, once again, just thank you, for, thank you for your incredible kindness. Thank you for that last song that we sang. Lord, you, you, you'll, you'll go to the top of a mountain to find us. You'll kick down a door to get to us. It's because of your love. I pray, God, that everyone that is listening today I pray, Lord, that we would know your love. I pray, God, that everyone that is listening today would abide in you, would remain in you. Regardless of what happens outside in this world, I thank you, God, for your word. I thank you for your church. I thank you for your people. I thank you for your spirit. I just pray, Lord, as we look at three thoughts, God, that you would encourage us and help us. We just commit this time to you in Jesus' name, amen. My first point is this, remain in God's Son, taken from John 15, 1 through 6. Remain in God's Son. I am the true grapevine, and my Father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch of mine that doesn't produce fruit, and he prunes the branches that do bear fruit, so they will produce even more. You've already been pruned and purified by the message I have given you. Remain in me, and I will remain in you. For a branch cannot produce fruit if it is severed from the vine. and You cannot be fruitful unless you remain in me. Yes, I am the vine, and you are the branches, and those who remain in me, and I in them, will produce much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. Anyone who does not remain in me is thrown away like a useless branch and withers. And such branches are gathered into a pile to be burned. Our Lord here is addressing a real <laughs> paradigm shift for these Jewish disciples. Up to this time, when referencing a vine, they would immediately think of the nation of Israel. Jesus is saying to them, your identification with the Jewish religion and the Jewish nation is not essential anymore. What's important now is for these disciples and all those coming, you, me, all of us that are here, is to be related to Jesus. This statement was, was, it was just revolutionary for these guys to hear. And it was going to change their life. The Lord is making it very clear here. It's not your identification with a religion, with a ceremony, or even an organization that is essential. What's most important now is your identification with Christ. And this, this identification, it comes the very moment you put your faith and trust in Christ as your Lord and Savior, the very moment that you are born again, you're adopted, 
Your name's written in the book, in God's book. You've been given a name, your name. Someday we're going to go to heaven. He's going to give us our new name, but your name is written in God's book. You are identified with him. Here's the, here's the key. That does not mean you're going to be fruitful. That's what the warning in, this, in these passages are about. Next to the Lord, he's addressing the subject of bearing fruit. And a question to ask would be, well, what kind of fruit is he talking about? I believe the answer is found in Galatians 5, 22. But the Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives. Love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness. And faithfulness and self-control. This is the fruit in the life of a believer. So here's a good question to ask yourself. Are you growing in these traits? Are you growing in your love and your joy? It, regardless of what's going on in this world, are you growing in your peace? When the whole world is in a tumultuous storm, do you still have peace? Are you growing in your patience for those that offend you? Are you growing in your patience, husband and wife? Mom and dad? Child and parent? Are you growing in your kindness? In your goodness? In your faithfulness? I'll say one thing, There's, there, there, there is a concern for me over the course of the last 11 months. And that would be, I pray that you are not creating some habits in your life that are contributing to an unfaithful life. You've got to get your, you got to get your hands on the plow again, maybe. You've got to get your eyes on the prize. Church, we need each other. And you need me and I need you. Are you growing in these traits? Fruit. Fruit's mentioned six times in these first ten verses. And Jesus here is referencing the bearing fruit. It's about, it's about fruit. It's not about salvation, you guys. So when you read these verses and it's about the branches get thrown, hey, it's not about salvation. Okay? He's speaking to disciples. He's speaking to followers. He's speaking to believers. And he's wanting you to be fruitful. This has nothing to do with being cast away from God. You can't lose your salvation. The Lord refers to us as branches, branches that are connected to the vine, and that vine is Jesus, and he needs to prune us. God's will for all believers is to be fruitful, to bear fruit, and to become more fruitful. And that will only come about when the master gardener God prunes us. So what would that pruning look like? Well, look at Hebrews chapter 12. And have you forgotten the encouraging words God spoke to you as his children? He said, my child, don't make light of the Lord's discipline and don't give up when he corrects you. For the Lord disciplines those he loves and he punishes each one he accepts as his child. As you endure this divine discipline, remember that God is treating you as his own children. Whoever heard of a child who is never disciplined by his father? You hear that, kids? If God doesn't discipline you as he does all his children, it means that you are illegitimate. You're not really his child at all. Since we respected our earthly fathers who disciplined us, shouldn't we submit even more to the discipline of the Father, of our spirits, and live forever? For our earthly fathers disciplined us for a few years, doing the best they knew how. God's discipline is always good for us so that we might share in his holiness. 
No discipline is enjoyable while it is happening. It's painful. But afterward, there will be a peaceful harvest of right living for those who are trained in this way. This discipline can come about through a variety of ways. But the key is, do we trust that God is doing what is best for us even when you're going through a hard time? Is the end result of that more love, more joy, more peace, more patience, more kindness, more goodness, more gentleness, more faithfulness, more self-control? Then praise God. We all need pruning in our lives. And sometimes that pruning is more severe than at other times. The key here is you're being pruned. You're not cut off. You're not being disregarded. You're not useless. The Lord is doing a work in your heart. Man, we have these spider plants that I've had for year, we've had for years and years and years. And you guys know what a spider plant is. Well, we don't keep them inside. We just keep them outside. And so then when it comes wintertime, like right now, I, I just stick them in the garage. And I've put them in different places and tried to keep them. And I mean, they really go through a tough time. These plants go through a really, really, really tough time. But when it comes springtime, and, and they're, they're, just, they're just so crazy ugly. I mean, they're just dead. They just look so bad. I mean, bad, bad. And so last year, I, I was sitting there, and most of the time I tried to pull out all, these, all this dead stuff, and I just thought to myself, I think my wife and I were just said, let's just give them a haircut. Let's just be done with it. Let's just cut them down, cut them to nothing, and see if they make it. I am telling you, those spider plants grew like, like they were in the Garden of Eden. It was a severe pruning. And yet they come back so much better. And you know, sometimes that's the way it is in our life with God. Sometimes we have to go through a severe pruning. But the end result, you're going to be more attractive than my spider plants. And Jesus is encouraging us. He really is. He's encouraging us to allow God the freedom to work in our lives. And the result, you know what it's going to be? It's going to be fruit, more fruit, and much fruit. Your life's going to be filled with love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness and gentleness and faithfulness and self-control. And it's going to be more and more and more. Isn't that the life that we want? Number two, we need to remain in God's word. John 15, 7 and 8. But if you remain in me and my words remain in you, you may ask for anything you want. And it will be granted. Whoa, this is sounding good. When you produce much fruit, you are my true disciples. And this brings great glory to my Father. So when I read these verses, I see a process here in just these two verses. The process is, number one, remain in Jesus. Number two, Jesus' words remain in you. And number three, then you're going to start praying in accordance to his will. And back to that, you may ask for anything you want. Oh, there, there, there's, a, there's a governor on that in, in, our, whole, in our heart and in our soul. So remaining or, by, or abiding is the key to a successful prayer life. William McDonald said this. The closer we get to the Lord, the more we will learn to think his thoughts after him. The more we get to know him through his word, the more we will understand his will. And the more our will agrees with his, the more we can be sure of having our prayers answered you're not going to be praying for a bmw why you're not going to be praying for you're not going to be praying for the temporal things of this world you're going to be praying for the eternal things of this world our lives as believers should reveal 
to the world, a life that is in a continual stage of transformation and change. And this change occurs, why? Because of God's Word and God's Spirit at work in our lives. And this change brings, brings glory to God. Your changed life as you grow, as you, as you work through the struggles and the trials and the challenges of your life, and as, you, and, and as people see this in your life, you're, you're growing and you're, you're, you're transforming, you're maturing, you're becoming more like, it just brings glory to God. Because there's no way you can do it on your own. We come into this world blind and alone. We come into this world actually an enemy of God. And through this transforming work of God, we are changed. We're changed. Like a caterpillar into a butterfly. A caterpillar that can only crawl and eat leaves. And then what happens? He, he goes into a slurry. A slurry. And he comes out with wings and legs. And he takes off from here and he travels all the way to Mexico. You see, that's a transformed life. That's a changed life. And we all, God wants us all to be in this transformational stage of life where we change, we're growing with him. And this life exhibits that fruit then. It's a fruitful life. And that's when people are forced to confess that he must be a great God when he can transform such wicked, wicked sinners, you, you, and me, into godly saints. I think of the Apostle Paul. I think of his transformed life who was Saul, a murderer of our brothers and sisters. And yet his life was changed. And it brought glory to God. I'm going to read you another one. Hang in there. The most horrifying thing about Jeffrey wasn't what came out in his sensational trial. For most folks, it's what happened to him later on in prison. Jeffrey was a serial killer before mass murders became commonplace news in America. Today, we hardly get time to digest one act of terror before we're confronted with another. But in the early 90s, Jeffrey's horror story captivated the nation. Eleven corpses had been found in his apartment. Before the investigation ended, it was discovered that he had murdered and dismembered at least 17 young men. But the grisly discovery that horrified America was the fact that this sadistic killer also cannibalized his victims. Searching the Internet, you will find pictures of the monster from Milwaukee. Setting in the courtroom during his trial, he sits serenely with steely eyes and an impassive face. There are no signs of remorse or, or hints of regret. It's no wonder that the world cheered when he was sentenced to life without parole. Even that seemed like too little of justice. How could the state ever exact enough retribution for those that this monster had lured into his chamber of horrors? But this is what folks still find most disturbing, Jeffrey Dahmer became what? A born-again Christian in prison? Oh, not him. He publicly repented for his despicable deeds. And after he was baptized, he sent letters of apology to his victims' families. Most people were skeptical, dismissing this, his newfound faith as a jailhouse conversion. Others were outraged arguing that God would never forgive such, such, such a monster. Then Jeffrey did the craziest thing in his crazy life. He asked to be released from solitary confinement. Prison officials told him that he was signing his own death warrant. But the born-again serial killer wanted to share his faith, so he was transferred to the general prison population, and the chaplain was so impressed by Jeffrey's spiritual growth that he made him his assistant, and the monster from Milwaukee was now reading the scriptures and serving communion. At the same time, fellow prisoners were plotting to kill him. 
When an inmate slashed his throat, he miraculously survived, and his parents begged him to return to solitary confinement. Jeffrey responded that prison was his mission field. A few days later, he was beaten to death in a prison restroom. When the news of his death was broadcast on November 28, 1994, the nation cheered. It was Thanksgiving Day all over again. Yet there was one fly in the ointment of justice. The prison chaplain told skeptical reporters that Jeffrey Dahmer was truly saved and in heaven. That claim sparked a national debate. Aren't there some sins and sinners so heinous that they are beyond God's grace? Maybe these questions are more relevant. Are some sins in your life beyond God's grace? Can others hurt you so badly that they are beyond your forgiveness? Jeffrey's story is disturbing, but it drives us to consider something Corey Ten Boom said when she was faced with forgiving those who abused and killed her sister in a Nazi concentration camp. No pit is so deep that God is not deeper still. Is God's word a steady part of your spiritual life? Without it, you will be fruitless. And without God's word as a steady part of your diet, there is a warning from Jesus. In these passages, here's the warning. He will look elsewhere. He will look to other branches to bear his fruit. So my prayer for us, Lord, may we all be abiding in your word, remaining in your son, and lastly, number three, remaining in God's love. John 15, 9 through 11, I have loved you even as the Father has loved me. Remain in my love. When you obey my commandments, you remain in my love. Just as I obey my Father's commandments and remain in His love, I have told you these things so that you will be filled with my joy. Yes, your joy will overflow. God's love for Jesus was perfect and complete. And Jesus' love for us is perfect and complete. And this love is God's love. It's agape love. Steve referenced it. A love that can only be experienced in a relationship with God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. This love is supernatural. The love that God has for us is vast, it's wide, it's deep, it's unmeasurable, it surpasses all knowledge. It can never be fully comprehended by man, but it's, it's real. I don't know. I just know it's real. Romans 8. Can anything ever separate us from Christ's love? Does it mean he no longer loves us if we have trouble or calamity or persecuted or, or hungry or destitute? or in danger, or threatened with death? As the scriptures say, for your sake we are are killed every day, we're being slaughtered like sheep. No, no, despite. This love has nothing to do with our circumstances. Despite all these things. Overwhelming victory is ours through Christ who loved us, and I am convinced that nothing can ever separate us from God's love. Neither death, nor life, angels, demons, our fears for today, our worries about tomorrow. Please, don't worry about tomorrow. God's got it covered. Not even the powers of hell can separate us from God's love. No power in the sky above or in the earth below. Indeed, nothing in all creation will ever be able to separate us from the love of God that is revealed in Christ Jesus, 
our Lord. When things are going well, we feel somewhat elated. But when hardships come, we sometimes feel depressed. But the joy of God overrides all the circumstances of this life. And Paul addressed this subject of joy 16 times in the book of Philippians. And he was writing a letter from prison. His joy comes from our relationship with Jesus. And when our lives are intertwined with his, he will help us walk through all adversity and love and joy go together. It's like one coin. We experience both as we learn to live a life of obedience and dependence upon him. And Jesus found his joy because of his communion with God his Father. He wants his, fo his followers to experience that same joy. Man's idea of joy is to be happy. Just to be as happy as he can be. By what? By leaving God out of his life. Exactly the opposite of God's way. The choice is always ours. One thing I was thinking about even this morning. One thing that I am really thankful for this past 11 months. This past 11 months has reinforced my faith and love for God. And I am thankful for this past year. I am more dependent on God. I have more faith. I have more courage. I have more confidence in the future. Why? Because this is so out of our control. And it makes, and it makes, you know, and, and the one thing that's happening here in this world with COVID and everything that's going on is this, boy, you're either going to lean more into God or you're going to lean further away. And I'm just so thankful that God's tractor beam has pulled me into him. How about you? Man, I'm thankful for this past year. Maybe a good thing to ask oneself as I close here is this. Is there something in your life that is separating you from God? Something that is affecting your relationship? Like I said last week, keep your list short. Keep it short. Examine your life. Be responsible when it comes to your part. When living a life of peace with all men. So in conclusion, as I looked at these 11 verses, remain in God's Son. Abide in Him. And you'll be fruitful. Remain in God's Word. May it be a steady part of your diet. May it be a steady part of your life. Obey it. And you will be fruitful. And remain in God's love. Tell Him you love Him. Acknowledge his love for you. And you will be fruitful. Father, I thank you again for the Candlewood family. I thank you for those that are here and those that are online. And I pray that you would just richly, richly, richly bless us. Lord, not so that we get things for ourselves, Lord, but we want to be blessed and exhibit a fruitful life for you. We want our lives to be a living sacrifice. We want our lives to be a testament of your great mercy and grace, your transformational love that affects each and every one of us. Help us, Lord, to be a light in a dark world. Help us to be the salt of the earth. Help us to be a city on a hill. Lord, I'm just so thankful that you're in charge. I do pray for our president. I pray for his cabinet. I pray for all those in authority. I pray for our House of Representatives and our Senate. I pray for our policemen and our medical personnel. I pray for our firemen and our armed, armed service personnel. I pray for our EMTs. I pray for all those in authority, our councilmen, our mayors. Our Lord, we just lift them up to you. Lord, may your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And Lord, as we're living out these days, I just pray that you would, you would give us hope and confidence and courage as we look to the future, Lord. Thank you for your son. Thank you for your word. And thank you for your love. And all God's people said,
Amen. God bless you. Have a wonderful day. Happy Valentine's Day, and see you next time.